Um, I've been looking forward to the chance to speak again here. Um, my friend Willie from Columbus Air Force Base has joined us. It's good to have him here too. Um, so, uh, what, you know, those of you that have heard me speak before, which I think is everybody here pretty much, uh, I like to take kind of broad concepts, things that we've um, heard in our tradition or encountered in our lives and we've just kind of left it at a surface level. Um, take these broader ideas in Christianity and dig into them in a way that makes them immediately practical, something we can use to um, develop our walk with God further, to, to become more of what we need to become. Um, you know, a couple of times ago, I got to speak about gratitude, and that was an awesome, uh, that was an awesome experience because leading up to that Sunday and then in the days after, I was full of gratitude. You know, by studying it, it, it was in me, and I, I felt the benefits of that firsthand. It was incredible, um, and I felt it since then. But there's something about when you spend an amount of time really digging into a topic, how it starts to just kind of resonate. You start to find it in all these places. And then the time after that, I spoke about faith, which was a little bit more challenging because I was trying to talk about something that's unknowable. Um, it's really difficult to do to take the vast unknowable part of the universe and put it into words. Um, and today, what I wanted to talk about was wisdom. Um, but I took a little bit of a different approach. Um, Bo and I have been going to a Bible study with some friends of ours uh, on Wednesday mornings. And in conversation, well, first of all, the Bible study is about how to approach the Bible right now is, is where we're at with it. And it's talking about paradigms, um, how your lens, how what you're bringing in your mind to your understanding of the Bible colors so much of the wisdom that's there. So if you can learn to change your mind or open your mind to more of what's actually there, you'll, you'll receive more of that wisdom. Um, and that was kind of what I was thinking about, what I was processing, and, and I see it in other places in my life that my mind can really determine my experience in a lot of ways. If I assume that people are making fun of me, then I'm carrying that energy with me instead of, you know, maybe they're not. And, and I miss an opportunity to just be a person with other people, um, things like that. But in that Bible study too, we talked about what Bo calls proof texting, which is where you have an idea and then you go find the scripture that matches the idea and you use that. I've, you know, I've done that before. I think everybody who gets into this does that at some point. Um, so this time I took a, a different tactic and I went to um, the Methodist uh, lectionary. I'm not Methodist, but because they're so methodical, they have a lot of resources available. And um, one of the recommended readings for this week completely resonated with that idea. And I was like, well, that's been my sign, so I'll run with it. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know about the rest of you. I, um, it took me until, you know, I was probably 30 before I realized that I am not my thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts, I think a lot, but I am not my thinking. Whatever I actually am can see my thoughts, is, is experiencing my thoughts, but it's not them. And it's an important distinction because, you know, think about like our emotions. When we're feeling sad, we don't say I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling happy, we say I am sad, I am happy. We identify with our thoughts, we believe we are the things that we're experiencing. And so learning how to make a distinction between those things that pass through our minds, those things that pass through us and who we actually are, is vitally important, I think, for um, tapping into to God's actual voice in our lives, tapping into the real wisdom that's there by setting aside our, our first impressions, our ideas about how things work. Um, so, uh, I have notes and uh, when I write notes, I tend to write them like I'm writing a thesis. They're very like wordy and defensive, and uh, I didn't want to do that. So I decided to just kind of set all that aside, and whatever I remember, whatever seems relevant, is going to be what comes out. But we're going to focus on the scripture first, and uh, and hopefully everything else follows. Um, but uh, you know, just keep in mind that what Paul's writing about here, what we're about to read, is in First uh, Corinthians, and Paul's writing about wisdom, but. Keep in mind the distinction, you know, between your thinking and what's true. There's a, there's a, a big gap there in a lot of cases. And, um, you know, Bo and I have both said this when we've had a chance to speak. One of the first things Jesus ever told us to do was to open our minds to change, was to learn how to set aside our paradigms so that we could actually understand or have a better understanding of what's actually going on in this world. Um, so to the scripture, we've got... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
Um, and this is Paul writing to the congregation. And in chapter one, he introduces, he starts by kind of, um, sorry, I'm sniffing so much. He starts chapter one by um, sort of scolding them because they are splitting up over different teachers in, the, in their congregation. You know, um, one person says things like, thank you. It feels like a bigger distraction to do this, but I guess it's not. <laughs> Um, you know, and we're, we're all pretty prone to that. I think uh, I think about that a lot myself. I have a select few teachers that I go to if I have some spare time and I want to um, get in some wisdom. You know, there are some YouTube lecturers or some podcasters that I gravitate towards because the way that they package information is the way that my mind likes to unpack information. So if there's a lot of commonality there, that doesn't mean other teachers aren't teaching the truth. It just means that their method doesn't resonate with me the same. And so this congregation was making the mistake of absolutely dividing themselves over that phenomenon. You know, one person says something that feels right to you in a way or feels more comfortable than somebody else. And so you follow them as a person when instead you should be kind of following the root of their ideas, which is what Paul goes on to say here in uh, chapter 2. So uh, verse 1, chapter 2, he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Um, I really like the way that Peter says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because this tells me that, you know, the, the words of wisdom, the tools, the intellectual kind of stuff was very much a part of it for Peter, or for, for Paul. It was very much there in his mind. But he made a conscious decision to set all of that aside and focus on that core root of the gospel, to only share that. Because he understood that from that, every person can, their brain can grow around it in the way that it needs to. Their mind can grow around the idea in the way that it needs to, to process it. And if you're, handed, if you're handed information in a very specific way, you tend to keep it that way. Um, I ran into that growing up Southern Baptist. Much of the gospel was handed to me with, I'll say, um, unnecessary add-ons. You know, there's a lot of guilt and shame and stuff that's not, doesn't have to be a part of the gospel. But I carried it with the gospel for a large part of my life. So Paul, in his understanding, um, cuts all that out and just gives them the simple truth to start with. Um, and, and in doing so, gives them a much better chance of finding their own toolkit, their own ability to dig into that wisdom, to dig into the truth, to unpack the image of Jesus Christ crucified and what that means for human beings and for this creation, um, so that they would have a stronger relationship to their creator than to a specific teacher. So then going on in verse 6, um, he says, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. So here he's going back a little bit. You know, he's, he's approached the congregation, and when he first began this, this church, um, gave them just the very basic seed and decided not to overcomplicate it, decided that that would be detrimental to their health uh, spiritually. But he, he counters himself here and says, we do use wisdom. Wisdom is a powerful tool um, for the mature, which means, you know, once you have advanced in your, your spiritual walk, a lot of these intellectual tools that we use to understand the truth are valuable if you're not confusing them with the truth itself. You have to be at a specific stage of your development to not get lost in the words of wisdom and in the, in the poetry of it all. Um, and he sees that and he's, he says that, uh, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. I think it's an interesting distinction to see um, him talk about the wisdom of the world versus, or the wisdom of the age versus the wisdom of God, saying that God's wisdom is something secret that was you know, before time itself that that truth goes beyond anything that's kind of here and now. It's it's beneath and around and above all of that. Um, 
an example of worldly wisdom is, you know, like I, I struggle with financial decisions, but there are people in my life who have, you know, learned the stock market and things like that. And when they have succeeded in that, they try to get me started and, and I, I'm not interested. And they're like, you're, you're being an idiot. Like, this is free money. Why don't you take the free money? And they, they see it as unwise to not participate. So the wisdom of the world tells me to play that game, to participate in that system so that I can reach specific benefits because that's what's important. But that's the world's wisdom. God's wisdom says all of this is only relevant here and now and in this culture. It's not the real truth. It's just a, a flash in the pan, honestly. None of that is the point. So Paul is saying that if um, that the wisdom that they actually pass between the mature, the spiritually mature in Christ, is not that worldly wisdom. It is, it is beyond that. Um, even quoting older scripture and saying what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Um, we may not realize it, but you know, as much as we have fantastic imaginations as human beings, we can't create anything new. We are only using what we've encountered in this life. Even when we come up with a new idea, it's synthesized from what, what exists. Um, as a creative person, I've written a couple of songs, but it would be incorrect to say that I, I created anything because those 12 tones already existed. The, the notes, the words, the ideas already exist in the world. I just took them and, and gave them a specific form. Um, that's, that's kind of what we are as human beings. We're taking in all this stuff and then we give back something. But we don't have, nothing seems to really originate with us. Um, and as a result, when it comes to things that are beyond time, that are, that are eternally true, like God himself, we can't conceive of that reality. It's so far beyond anything we've ever encountered. So here he's pointing out that our minds are limited to the point that we can't, we can't even imagine what God has in store for creation. It's just, it is, it's as different from this as an uh, oak tree is from its acorn. You know, you wouldn't look at an acorn and say, that's going to be huge one day. And you would have no concept of, of what shape it was going to take, but that's the relationship that those two forms have. So in a similar way, this world and whatever comes next are just as connected and just as different, just as inconceivably separate. Um, so by teaching, by, by using the scripture, he's reminding us that you know, even our best ideas about God, even our best ideas about eternity are going to fall short from the real thing. And, and so the most important thing we can take from that is that we're never going to know. If you can, in my life, what's been most valuable is to say, the only thing I know for sure is that I don't know anything. Because if I, if I believe that, then I'm open to every new piece of information that comes to me. I'm open to exchange my smaller ideas for the bigger truth every time I run into it, instead of trying to make the big truth match my little idea about the world. Um, going on to verse 10, it says, These things God revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Um, <clears throat> you've heard me talk before probably about contemplative prayer, or you know, in other cultures they would call it meditation. Um, but I believe that you know, when we were instructed to pray Obviously, there's uh, um, the Lord's Prayer gives us a really good structure for what kind of thoughts that we should organize towards God if we're going to try to communicate. But ultimately, when we're told to pray, we're told to do it in secret, in private, with the door closed, with no distractions. And I think that's to guide us to a place where we can just sit with silence. In this culture, we don't sit with silence. In this culture, we've taken our thinking, the thinking part of the human, and made it the most important part. Um, you look at our society, we, we flock to people we consider to be intellectually talented to be our leaders, to tell us what to do, to tell us where we're going and how we're going to get there. And if you look at the world in its current state, that hasn't gone very well, because the intellect tends to serve itself. It's also kind of, you know, that old adage, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you think the mind is the most important thing, if you think that your, your thinking capability is all that there is, then everything looks like a problem to solve or something to dissect when there are things in the world that need to be held together. And um, this is where, for me, like 
learning how to think non-dualistically has been helpful. So anytime I'm, I encounter two extremes, instead of immediately picking a side based on my gut reaction, I step back and I try to see how they're related and what the truth is between the two. And that seems to be a good way of shutting my mind down because it can't, it's not the first thing it wants to do. The first thing the mind wants to do is to pick a side so you know where you stand. But if you can learn to let that go and be comfortable with the you know, uncertainty of it, there's a lot more truth, a lot more wisdom, and a lot more love available in that space. Um, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. When we're quiet, when we're not filling the silence with our thoughts, with entertainment, with you know anything else, you can feel the presence of God inside you if you're looking for it. It's it's quiet. It's small. It's I mean, it feels small because we're not super used to tuning into it, but if we practice that, if our prayer practice every day, instead of listing off all of our worries and concerns, was to be quiet and to hold on to that silence long enough to feel that sort of gentle push in a new direction, we would be able to change our, our lifestyles, we'd be able to change all the patterns that have us stuck. So I, so much of the gospel, so much of, of wisdom seems to be telling us not to get too stuck in what we choose to do. We're very good at getting stuck. It's very hard to learn how to be free from all of that. Um, it says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The distinction that we can make between ourselves and our thoughts is an important one because when you learn to observe your thoughts, when you learn to see your thinking from a distance instead of being wrapped up in it, you have the chance to change that thinking over time. It's not immediate. But like in my case, you know, there are certain people that I've encountered and my first thoughts are not usually positive. And that's not what God wants, and I know that for certain, you know. So if I can catch myself, if I can see, oh, you're having that negative reaction again, and I can distance myself from it internally, then I can allow that to change over time where when it pops up, I catch it again, and I choose to change it. And the next time I see that person, I'm used to that process, and then eventually I forget that I even had negative thoughts about them in the first place. You you replace it with the better thing, and I think that's so much of what this is. Um, now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this wisdom not in words taught by, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Um, this is, this is what it's all about. This is why we're here right now, is we wanted to gather and, and to, to feel that inflow of, of something new from God, something that gives us some guidance, some direction, some definition in our, in our walk. Um, and the crazy thing is, it's, you know, we gather around somebody with a microphone, me or Bo or somebody else, because we have a, a way with words and a way of packaging this wisdom and sharing it. But the words are secondary. The words are just to keep your mind focused while you're doing the real thing, which is being here, being present, being open, that's the thing that you need to be able to do everywhere else in your life to find that voice of the Holy Spirit in you. So we're practicing that right now, but it looks like a lecture, right? Um, verse 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. When it says the natural person, I think it means, like, like I said, uh, you know, until very recently in my life, I did not know I wasn't my thoughts and feelings. I didn't see the space between those things in my life and what I actually am, who I actually am, mm -hmm. who God is building me into. And that's a very natural thing. When you encounter people in the world like atheists who hold on to a rigid idea about what exists and what doesn't exist based on what they can measure, that's a very natural thing. They're basing their view of the universe on their five senses. They're not thinking spiritually. They're not using the parts of themselves that don't measure the same way, that don't interact with the physical world the same way. We, as believers and as Christians, we are training ourselves to listen to that first so that this stuff doesn't get in the way of doing what's right and what's good in God's eyes. Um, 
He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. This is where there are multiple layers to the gospel, the way that I see it. Very many of us make prayers directly to Jesus Christ as a living entity, as a being, and I think that we should. I think that that's true. There's another layer of the gospel where you look at it as a human being who surrendered his entire existence over to his creator, and that by doing so, he accepted his own death, and he healed, and he was present with the people in, his, in the communities he found himself in, and that's what God wants of us, is to be, to not be so wrapped up in fear of, of dying that we don't live, that we don't participate here and now. There's another layer of the gospel. Another layer that I see is with Jesus being that living entity and with us trying to be humans like that human version of Jesus that surrendered itself. I think that when the wisdom, when we, when we encounter real wisdom, when we encounter that feeling of, I, I think, I hope everyone here has experienced it, but when you're just overwhelmed with that sense that everything is okay, even when there's pain and suffering around you, and mm -hmm. you just get that feeling that it does mean something and that it is good because you're here and you're experiencing it and you feel love and you feel all of that. I, I believe that that's, that's Jesus stepping into you for just a moment, giving you just a little bit of his vision of what this is and how we should approach it because that's the only way we'll ever learn to carry that ourselves. And so here where it says, the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Right after that, uh, in the next chapter, I don't have the verse up there, but he says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So even there, he's, he's making spiritual a spiritual person, the spiritual person that is judging, but judged by no one. That's such a, an aspirational thing. I don't even think he considers himself that. I think he's talking about that spirit of Christ coming through and where that wisdom comes from because there's this quality to real wisdom where when you hear it, you know it's true on some level and it's like your mind is just now catching on to it. Like some part of you already knew this, but your brain just figured out how to hold it so that you could do something with it. And so that's really what I wanted to focus on is our minds, our thinking selves, our emotions, our feelings, all of this part of us that we've really built up in this culture to be pinnacle of humanity.